So today uh, I will talk a bit about oh, okay. put the folding uh, and I put you some papers. So put the folding has a sort of double meaning sometimes. It's both kind of the process of folding and then sometimes in the biophysics aspect it's like the ability to predict the structure of a protein from just a minus sequence. And I will sort of mix these things a little bit. So I will try to uh, I'll talk most of the bioinformatical aspect of it, but just <coughs> to provide some background, I will talk, tell you a little bit about very, very general about protein folding. There is a class in protein physics that is kind of focused on this in, I think it's in January. Formerly it's at KTH, I think, but it, it is also in Stockholm University code for it. So, it's, so if you want to learn more, that's one option. So the idea in protein folding is to, what happens is that you have your protein sequence with different type of amino acids. And at first, or at least it can exist in some kind of unfolded state, which is basically like, like any other random polymer, more or less. Uh, and then somehow it's posed together and become much more rigid protein. It has a rigid, it has a fixed structure. Of course, it's not frozen. Right? The vibrations are not really more, more frozen. And it was shown by Anfinsen first, who got the prize for it, that basically all the information how this folds is in the sequence. Basically, what he did was he take lysozymes, a typical protein. And unfold it by you heat it, or you can add urea, or you can do other things to it. And then he reversed this, he cold it down again. And then he could get it to fold back and become active again. So for the, if there was some, so it was really some process of, uh, and you can do it in test strips, so it was something that you needed some enzyme to do it, or something like that. Or if you needed to, it was another state over here that was completely different, they could go trapped in, they would go trapped there. So his argument then was that this is the free energy minima of this protein structure. And that is generally true for most proteins. There, there are, I mean, there are few cases where you really can make an argument against it, but in general that's true. So how does this process happen? And it's actually quite fast. It happens in milliseconds, so in the worst case in seconds, most cases. There are some enzymes helping here in some, for some proteins, called chaperones. And well, some other proteins, but they are not, most of them are not, for most proteins, they're not needed. And you, you should also remember that in uh, a cell, it's actually quite crowded. So there's a lot of other proteins there, so there's a lot of uh, data, a lot, lot of other proteins can interact with. So the major problem is maybe not that the protein misfolds, it's actually sort of interacting with something else, and this starts to aggregate. If anybody knows biochemistry, you know that proteins can aggregate quite easily. But already some, maybe almost 10 years ago, you could actually do some simulations of this. And let's see if we get to work. So this is a very, very small protein. It really help this. It looks like that. So this is really what you would define maybe as the smallest possible protein. So it's really, because it really has a hydrophobic core. Do you remember that proteins are hydrophobic on the inside? So this has, a couple two, I think, two superfans here that are forming core, so it has basically two helices in pack, or three helices in pack together. So I think it's 29 amino acids. And then there is this, this kind of sort of, oh, oh shit, now, what's my plan? Mm. And you can see then, ah, uh, click there. You can see it's, it's six microseconds, so it's an extremely fast folding pro program, protein. And only in reality and also in the simulation, so you can, Start an extended chain into some simulation, and you, you can see it starts moving around, and you can see what's happening somehow. Quite fast. But at the end, it sort of wibbles around a bit, and it forms the helices and sort of packs together. And after some more time, it actually even gets exactly to the structure it has. I guess this one has to flip around like that first. So now it's almost there. Look. Perfect. So this is what's called a molecular dynamic simulations. So it's basically a simulation of the motions of proteins. That's basically 
won part of the Nobel Prize last year. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that's uh, uh, it. Sort of works for Willen headpiece, but it doesn't work for bigger proteins in general because it's basically sim folding time is way too long, and maybe even the ac also the accuracy of the calculation are not, not, not good enough to do that. Do you know how long does it take to compute this? This uh, depends on when the computer you have. If you have one computer, I mean, I think that they do it in a. Well, this is actually you can do it in well, a few hours or a day if you run it on a big cluster. Because yeah. it's uh, they do. I mean, I'll come back to it in a second. What they actually do is that if, if, if you, I, 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 that, that's two things. One thing is actually you can actually parallelize the simulation quite efficiently. I mean, I did think one simulation will start one point and you simulate long time. That's very difficult. To run on a very very big cluster, I mean, you can run it on a few hundred nodes, but you cannot run it on five million machines. But uh, actually, you don't you don't need to do it because of course, it's basically what you're doing is that you're searching the free energy landscape, and if you you can start many simulations, and, so, and the most takes time is jumping over the borders. So if you just restart the and you jump over the border, you can do it in parallel, much more efficiently, and then you can do it in a, within a day or maybe two days, even a few hours on a, on a big cluster. Uh, then there is one uh, company or one guy more or less that has made his own special purpose hardware called Anton that, it, that actually probably can do all this in one machine in probably a couple hours or something like that. But I, I, I come back to it a bit more in detail later. So that's, that's, um, okay, so, the, so the, this is somehow what fully happens in reality. So for the last 40 years or something like that, people had have a, called ab initio or de novo protein structure prediction. Basically, you want to take a sequence and you want to simulate or you want to take a sequence and you want to predict structure. And basically, the idea was of course, we want to use this when homology modeling is not possible. Basically, you have no homologs, you have nothing else. But also, it's a fundamental important. Uh, I mean, well, it's fundamentally important to understand it because if we want to understand the physics behind it, it's something we want to have for the big problem. And also, if we, if we understand this physics here very carefully, we can do other things. Like one classic problem I'm going to talk so much about is basically the protein design problem. So basically, can I design a sequence that folds into the structure? And basically, it's the same energetical problem, the same problem you need to solve. This is much, uh, somewhat much simpler problem because you don't you only have one structure. And you have to work in secret space to find the structure that falls there. And here you have basically the structure space is bigger, but it's uh, actually probably maybe more useful also because you can assign uh, proteins that are thermostable or that are uh, good vaccines, etc. So it has been a big part of a long time. And you can basically divide it into two problems. That if, you, if, you, if you want to, from a computational point of view, there's an optimization problem and there's or well, in two different ways, don't you? Uh, you can basically you can f you, you can see the optimization problem. You can say that you have some model based on some energy. You just come, okay, I have given this confirmation, this protest, I have an energy, uh, and then you basically try to find the global minimums. You can try whatever tricks you want to do. So that's me basically want to fold it somehow. But and of course, in any of course, you can also try to simulate it like you do in the molecular dynamics. Uh, and if you accurately simulate it, hopefully, if your you model is accurate enough, you really want to simulate the whole process. So here, basically, you can skip if you, if you have some tricks. You can you don't have to reproduce the dynamical aspect of it. You just want to find the lowest energy. Maybe you want to generate many different models in some smart way, and you just pick the best one. And or, but here, you really need to describe the whole folding process, which of course give you more, much more insight. So this is basically more like a dynamics, and this is more the computational informatics problem. So, so this is like, so both these approaches or a mix of these are also used somehow because even this of course somehow describes the physics in some way and this is, has been used and tried and for different parts. I mean this new hoop due to large search space, well that depends on the size of the problem, but it really gets much more complicated as soon as the protein gets bigger. And the problem is not to calculate often the, one, one main problem is how do you deal with water? 
So really the protein doesn't have so many atoms to calculate, but if you, you need to have it in a water solution, and the water is of course many more particles. So then we say, okay, so in both these cases, I need to have some kind of energy function, some kind of um, <coughs> uh, energy function, and uh, of course you would say, okay, ideally I would let no understand laws of physics. We are pretty good at physics. We know pretty much. Well, you can have Schrodinger equations, but that's really not applicable at all. Because I guess it gets too, you can manage that for a benzene ring or something, like but nothing, nothing bigger. So for, you have to simplify on some level. So what level is the level you simplify on? Most of that. What has turned out to be very useful level is basically some kind of classical mechanical model. So in molecular dynamics, most of the time you have classical mechanics. So you basically describe atoms as particles. You ignore all the quantum effects, unless you want to study some enzymatic reactions. But uh, uh, you could simplify it even more. You could have just one atom describing many, or one sphere describing many, many atoms. You could have limited confirmation of spaces. Atoms. You can do a lot, lot of things like that. And there are things that you have combined in different ways. And particularly, you can also take the the energies you can take from really calculation of physical interactions, you know how two atoms interact, you can just do that from calculating studying small molecules, you can do that quite accurately. Or alternatively, you can take more much more statistical approach uh, uh, where you have uh, calculated the probability to find two residues that interact, as we did in the full recognition problem we talked about just uh, last week. So Anyhow, whatever you do there, you have two, two problems. You have, you have the sample problem and the energy minimum problem. So basically, the sample problem, you need to have uh, how can I search all possible space, uh, space all possible models, because there are many different models. There's this, what is called this Leventhal's paradox, which, as maybe I mentioned, but if you have only three confirmations for each rest of you, in a 100 minutes long sequence, you have 3 to the power 100 possible confirmations. And that is a number that is bigger, larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's a gigantic number, it's like 10 to 50 or something, 10 to 30 or something. Else. And uh, so that's a gigantic number. Uh, and uh, so basically, you, you can't search all possible confirmations, so you need to limit it somehow. And you can use it off lattice or on lattice. So you can make lattice is basically fixed. Points in space. Most methods use offline nowadays, but there are reasons to use one another. Uh, and the energy problem here I, is uh, basically you need to, in principle, you can easily use some kind of statistics or you can use some kind of more physics based. And it, 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 in practice, they are maybe not that different. It's trying to describe the same features. And also, the physics is somehow made for statistics also, but the, the difference is somehow in the physics you try to calculate for small molecules. So what is the cost of small uh, cost of small molecules, and what is the and you try to describe that? And the particular problem in both these cases is, is basically how do you describe entropy? So I mean, in a dynamical system, you don't have to bother about it, but entropy is a major factor otherwise, because of course there's an entropic cost to bio side chain. And also, how do I describe water in a good way? Ideally, in micro dynamics or in micro dynamics nowadays, you basically always have water as explicit spheres, but that's computationally expensive. The computation is expensive for two reasons. One is actually the many atoms to calculate. Second is actually that it takes time to equilibrate. Because if you put something in the water, it takes quite a lot of time for, it, for the water to equilibrate around it. So every large movement you do, you need to take time. So that means you can't, you can't do the motions very fast. If you do it without water, if you have some implicit water model, you can do motions much faster. But they are generally much less accurate. Of course, we uh, you know that if you have an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of typefaces, it would eventually write, recreate all the works of Shakespeare. And also, similarly, an infinite number of CPUs could eventually fold every known protein. I think you get some candles and made this. What happened now? Yeah, for it. So the way they kind of made this full new machine. I don't know if it works, but they claim it works. Okay. So let's uh, 
start with a bit of uh, molecular mechanics. So, m so th this is really not this course not in molecular mechanics. This is this, this other course in uh, five weeks that is much more about molecular mechanics. But I just mentioned very briefly anyway. So basically, the molecular dynamics you can think about it as, as a classical non-quantum description of, of interaction between atom pairs or atoms. So yeah, it's only pairs interactions. And then basically you just use Newton's second equation and you just do small time steps and you simulate the motion. So this is just computationally, in theory it's very sim simple. The trick is really, there are a number of tricks, but one trick is really to get the energy functions correct. So really, what is this charge of each atom, what is the uh, constants for bond length, etc. Et so there are a lot of energies that need to optimize. And they, and they are interdependent. So if you change one charge of one atom, that would affect other things. So there has been a lot of work to develop better and better force fields. And one of the most difficult parts is actually to develop a good water model. It's really hard to make water a good water model because and water we know a lot about, so you can really test it quite carefully. So I can even see, but, but the models are there, so you can get for if you want to calculate solvation energy of uh, an amino acid, like that. then you can get quite accurate predictions, calculations. They are really quite good. The problem is that what you do here is you have each time step is an order of picosecond. That's how long. If you do longer time steps, you would basically atoms would jump into each other, so you can't do it. So you have picosecond time steps. It's 10 to minus 15. By folding is a million millisecond to second scale, it's a time scale at least. So you need to do a 10 to 12, 10 to 15 calculations for all atom pairs in a protein. So that means you end up with order of 10 to 20 calculations, which take a long time. So microseconds time scale you can probably simulate today. If you put it there. And as I say, the problem now is really that that tricks you. It's hard to simulate longer, but it's so basically because you can't parallelize it's very efficient for two big systems. But you can simulate many simulations in, in, in parallel instead. Another problem is was how accurate are the enterprise. We really describe everything because of course the, we know that folding is there's I mean there are a lot of interactions. Even if you have only one percent error in each interaction, if you have hundreds of these you get a lot of large error. Or you have tens of thousands you have. Uh, there is a project called Folding at Home. I'll come back to that in a second. So the idea is basically that you have a lot of parallel simulation on distributed computers. And you have, in this we can actually do microsecond simulation, but they're parallel, they're not one long simulation. It runs on a lot of machines, and uh, well, we used to have a PlayStation 3 running it there in the, ki in the kitchen, not any longer, because it's too slow and old. And you can fold small proteins, but not big proteins there. Uh, often they don't, don't use an explicit water model. Well, let's get to, so this is folding at home. The folding at Stanford DDU. Why, what are proteins and why do they fold? And the, this is their the homepage. It's probably, this is certainly much idea here. So the idea here is basically that you, you take you divide the job into work units. You know, you job into small job, small parts, and you distribute that to people on the world. So the key thing here is actually to get people to contribute to computing time. So basically, the electricity. So people are a bit strange. They like to give away things for free, and at least they can have a competition and win something. Or you can't win anything. They can win the glory. Oh, and uh, they, of course, they, they believe that they help the world also by solving important problems. Uh, so, let's look at that. Welcome back to DLTV. I'm Veronica Belmont. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. And so you've got some information on folding at home, exactly what it is you're folding. Yes, indeed. We are the, we're very big advocates of the folding at home project, and it's basically a way of using those extra cycles in your computer to help out with a project that's dedicated toward exploring, you know, what proteins are doing and how they mm -hmm. work and what can go wrong and 
basically how to avoid what goes wrong. And we had a little uh, trip down to Stanford University to talk to Professor Pondy, who runs the project. Oh, cool. Is, and I believe we have a little video to show off with an interview for him explaining exactly what it is that proteins are doing and how they do work. So let's take a look at that. Could you explain the protein folding process in the animation right behind you? So what we're looking at here is um, a, a, one of the sort of landmark simulations from Folding at Home. It's a very long simulation. And the visualization does not show all the detail because if I showed all the detail, you wouldn't be able to see everything. So for one thing, I've removed all the water from the visualization. There's all this water that goes into the calculation because proteins in space aren't very interesting, but proteins in water are the way things work. But if I showed you all the water, you wouldn't be able to see everything. Also, in this protein, I've sort of colored things in different ways, that some stuff is, compl is solid and some stuff is shown in these little sticks. These things are the amino acids that come off the protein backbone. And the protein is made up of like a chain of different amino acids, and each one has a different chemical characteristic. And I'm only showing the ones that, I, that are interesting for the purpose of this movie in Spaceville. These are the ones that are hydrophobic, um, uh, the ones that are aromatic uh, from, in terms of chemical language. And what we're looking at here in this movie is that the protein actually did not fold so far. It's actually collapsed into something kind of random and, and misfolded. And in some ways, it's kind of a lot like someone who doesn't know how to parallel park, that's trying to parallel park, and that they, you know, they get into the space and they're kind of stuck there. And once you're stuck, you can't really sort of just fix it. You, you basically have to do what you can or basically come out of the parking spot and come back in. Once it breaks out, it's actually going to come out and then kind of like a drunk guy trying to parallel park, he's going to try to come back in and it's actually not going to get it right on the second time and then come back out and come back in. And every time it does it, it gets something a little more right, as we see in this movie. And that actually helps it fold on its way. So right now it's still basically sitting in this first collapse state, although it's been exploring lots of different possibilities. So this is what we're seeing here, is that this is one of the first unfolding events in this part of the simulation. And um, it sort of came out of the parking spot and came back in. Uh, it came out again and it's coming back in. And now it's basically uh, trying to do things, uh, trying to get to its folded state. And certain parts of what it's doing are right and certain parts are wrong. Um, and it's, it's just trying its best to, to get things into the right spot. It's, it's going to go through this actually a couple different times, and it's actually already starting to make some progress. So that interaction actually is correct, and some of this stuff, this actually, it's hard f to see it on uh, very visually, but this is actually forming an alpha helix right now. So this part's correct, and this part's correct, and actually now it's formed this triple part of the core, so that part's correct, and it just really needs to just be able to put these final pieces together and actually and that's when it does that. So it got each of those pieces and finally just sort of flipped around and locked in. And now it's actually basically folded. This part is actually intrinsically unstructured, so it's going to flop around like a flag. But this part of the protein is, is the part that's folded, and it's pretty rigidly sitting there. Unlike the rest of the movie, where it's sort of moving around, here it's basically locked into the right state. Thank you, Professor Pondy. And, of course, we've got to do the quick update for Team and yeah, then they have like all these teams, you can compete, and you can do most cycles, and you can get high up on the list. You know, so that's how they manage to commit people to do it. So, th so this is one way of, of doing molecular dynamics, basically divide into small parts. You divide it into that people do it. There are some physics behind it that you need to, how to combine them together. The good thing about it is basically, yeah, you can run it on each machine individually, and if it crashes, you have to restart it somewhere else. That's not the problem. And then, as I said, there was the other people who tried to do this was this DE Shaw who happened to be, gain, earn some billions in uh, on the stock market. Uh, and then he wanted to do for the folding. So he built this machine here called Anton. So there's a very special purpose hardware. I think they built five of them or ten of them or something like that. So that you, can, you, can, you can actually borrow to simulate. But it's hard. So basically, it's hardware. So basically, the CPU is specially, specifically designed to just do fold, put in simulations, nothing else. And they are they can simulate milliseconds. They can simulate much longer than anything else, probably thousands long more than anything else. And then one simulation, long one. And they can they have managed to fold things like that. Like your whatever that was. BPT, I guess it is. Yeah. And this is the event basically. This is the the, the simulation here is you know, it's um, so this is how far away you are from the native structure. So basically if you one angstrom away, one angstrom is the length of one bond length. So that's kind of the basic spot on. But you see here, also, as they did another simulation, it, it started quite close beginning, then it jumped up for a while, then we go further away, then go back, and then up again, and then up here, and then up here. So it jumps between, between, but 
So the most stable state is how here, something very close. Negative is that I'm packing some side chain here, right? Dead and bottom. And, uh, yeah, so I mean, you can see, calculate some uh, uh, how long how stable it is and the energetics of it. You know, it's quite well reproduced. This, I, I was actually personally quite surprised that it worked so well. Like, I didn't think that any function was good enough. They had to fine tune a few parameters to any functions, like some small sort, but in general, it actually worked. Not only for one proton, but for several protons. So that's indicated somehow if, if there were, yes, yeah, maybe it's five to thousand faster than that, you can you actually could fold big protons with that. And they use explicit water, they don't work with implicit water, they use similar to all the water models, they just wait for a long time. And it's not, um, so it, it, there might be progress, and I guess, I, I would guess they're working, making an Anton 2, but I. I don't know anything about it. Because of course the problem with when you made this special purpose hardware is that normally it takes such a long time to make it, so that once you made it, the normal computes are faster and it's not much faster. But I think they, 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 they were probably, when people tried before, but then it was never as successful. Okay, so now it takes one step back. So if, we, if, if it's too slow to use a good molecular dynamic model, can we use some simplified models? And how much can we simplify them? And, and, and can we actually, even if we can't maybe do protein folding with this, maybe we can learn something about protein folding from them. And uh, actually, it's been quite a lot of work on very, very simple models. So, so let's watch. Lattices are just squares, like it were diamond squares or something, like that, where things, where the atoms can only be on the edges of the lattice, on the nodes of the lattice, and the edges are bonds. So, absolutely the simplest model you can make is probably something like that. You make it in two dimensions. And maybe also two types of amino acids, you have normally hydrophobic and polar. And you say this represents a protein in two dimensions. Of course, this doesn't look like a protein at all. You can't get the helix or anything like that. But in some aspects, it actually looks basically like a protein. It, it's a chain. It has amino acids of different types with different um, properties. I can diff make different sequences to see how they behave. And the good thing is about that I can exhaustively search all possible confirmations. I can, if the short is, well, not if it's too long, but if it's short, I can just enumerate all possible confirmations. This is a limited number of it. I know exactly, I can know exactly the sum of this data. So, and you can, so you, you can easily say, so I don't have to cover the whole thing, but I can take this chain here, I can take it, this is the lowest any confirmation I can find. I know that, I can prove it. So I tried all other confirmations. I don't know if it's possible this long, but I probably can do it this one. At least you can do it for absolutely. Oh, I mean, of course, you can also do simulations, you can do dynamic aspects of it. So, so in many ways, you can make these very, very simple models behave like uh, proteins. They are not useful for predicting structure, maybe, but they are very useful for understanding some aspects of protein folding. Uh, yeah, so you can do it quite easy. Um, basically, you can uh, move around, you can be the lattice, and you can just move it. And also, you have some kind of uh, energy that is just, uh, if you have tried a phobic distribution, actually, you have good energy. And if it's, uh, if they are real, to have a phobic, uh, to have a phobic next to each other, you have a blow, good energy. And if you have, if they are, how does it have a philic, uh, I mean, as it's, Interaction. You can, you can define different energy functions. You can define with phantom amino acid types instead of instead of instead of two. And you can have some interaction, parallel interactions. And you, this is basically this is interaction between two residues, and this is basically interaction with the surface. So you can describe many of the properties that you have of real protein. And, you, and of course, you can also go up to three dimensional. So you can see that this is supposed to be three. So you can do it three D also. So what have you done? What so how has this been used? Why it has the used answer number questions like, well, as I said, you can calculate all possible compact structures, or compact in some cases. You can design many sequences. So, a classic example is made on a 3 by 3 by 3 lattice. You have 27 uh, lattice. And I think this is in the order of 110,000, 110,000 different confirmations you can have by 27 long. Uh, chain in the 3 by 3 by 3 lattice. So you start in one place and you go out. So you can generate 110,000. 110,000 is not that much. You can just, I mean, it's easy to go through all of them. 
that's all the compact conformation, all the fits in a 3 by 3 by 3 cube. And then you can ask, for instance, you can ask, you know, take a sequence, does it have a one unique minimum, or are there many unique minimums? If I do a folding, so, so and some sequences will have one unique minimum, some will not have it. And uh, then you can say that proteins, because they fold into uh, a unique minima, and generally most proteins do. So, okay, so what is it that differentiates these sequences that have one minima compared to the ones that have money, many? Or the ones that you can have, you can also, if you do simulation, you can say how long time does it take to fold? You can simulate it and say what, what are the sequences that are folding fast, the folding slow? So there was a lot of, lot, lot of quite a lot of work on this to so try to figure out okay, what, what are the properties that are important for protein sequences to fold? How many all possible sequences fold? What, what, what is the number of protein sequences fold? How does... So basically, the, somehow you try to solve this levin class paradox, basically. We cannot search through all conformations, but we can... We know the proteins, pr proteins cannot search all conformations either, because there are many conformations, but it folds fast. And uh, so, and the, what people come up with is that the sequences that behave like real proteins are kind of following a funnel. So, uh, so they have like a way to fo fall down and to. F so there's not one, one way, not, not one path that follows, but there are many different paths that all lead down to the d same ending. In some ways, like this uh, uh, simulation regime where something unfolds a bit and it falls down there, it's not like if you do 10 simulations, you exact exactly the same pathways. Sometimes there are some crucial points that are important for this one has to form first, otherwise it's just going to form. But there are not only one way, there are many different ways to get there, often. On the other hand, these are not really abstract predictions, these are kind of useless abstract predictions. What, what have people shown was actually use complex lattices, you can use uh, a lattice that look at this. And preferably there's a group of like Kolinsky and Skolnik and other people that have used really complex lattices. If you use this, uh, so this is supposed to be three minus one. So this looks like a beta sheet and this looks like a helix. And so here you have like you jump two steps on one side and one, two, three, four steps in one, one direction. This one actually looks one, two, three in this direction, four in other directions. So you can jump a little bit, bit, bit thing here. The good thing about this kind of lattice models is that they are uh, compared to working in real space, you limit your, your search a lot, but you can still make things look quite a lot like proteins. But and you can of course you can put side chains here also, it's just kind of a side chain goes one direction here. Yeah. And the good thing is th th that's some advantages. Particularly the advantages are that they are way much faster than not that if, if you do it correctly, um, they are very fast. And you can think, another thing is that actually implicit exclude, for exclude the volume. And one thing is when you do folding of proteins, that you don't want two atoms to collide. And of course, you know that in lattice, you know that they can't collide, because you say that, that this is already occupied. Uh, of course, there has a disadvantage also. They are always an approximation, and they don't allow a precise construction. You want to be a bit fix things, bonding from a bit, you can affect things like that. I mean, both lengths, if you go from 3 to 4 to 2 to 4 different lengths, and things that are not going to be exact to create. And another problem is that they're probably and they're not very easy to implement. The computer, uh, programming and getting right is, is a pain. So basically, they're only, that's why there are only a few people in the world that do it. So what people mostly use today is some kind of non-lattice model. So basically, they try to work in real space. So in real space, they have a model that somehow resembles uh, protons. So this is, would be a simplified model. This would be a model we have the backbone is really like all atoms in a, in, a, in a normal backbone. But the side chain here is just one big sphere, an R. So that depends on size and the position of it depends on what time it is. So of course you would save on average about at least half the atoms. So if, there is, if you have all interactions, that's, I mean you have one uh, square root of the number of interactions. And probably a bit more because the sizes are more than the backbone. Uh, of course, you miss all the details of, of the side chain here. So you have, of course, this specific charge group here. You have to spread, smear it out of the whole thing here. But you, you can do it. Uh, 
So, so that people have played around with diff, diff, different th- things, and you, even people that have played around with things, they only have to see alphas, you only have one rest like that, and then you have a some kind of bond between these. So you, you can do that. And another thing is that people often work with, in molecular dynamics, we, we work in normal Cartesian coordinates, you have x, y, z, and so you move things point to uh, Ongström's one direction, that, and, but often you can work in, fascis, ta, in torsional angular space, that you can only change the phi psi angles, so you only move in the Ramachana plot. And I said basically, we, 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 basically most of the structure of, of, of a back, pull and backward can be described by two variables for residue. So instead of having uh, one, two, three times three, nine dimensions, you basically can reduce it down to two dimensions. Assuming that uh, all the bond lengths and bond angles are fixed. So you have the rotations around these two. And that is probably quite a good approximation. The problem with that, one problem, well, then if you want to have more details, you need to have rotations on the side chains also. And the omega, but the omega is basically planned now, so you can skip it. So you also have to rotate the side chains. But basically, on a longer time scale, at least you can assume that bond angles and bond lengths are more or less fixed. <coughs> so of course you save up the dimensions in your, in your optimization problem, but you are have some problems. One problem is if you make a small change here, is that something on the other end of the chain will move very much. So you ideally want to change several at the same time to do that. Uh, so uh, and therefore they're certainly not independent from each other. And uh, the also that you can actually use. There are, even, even if there are two dimensions, really, there are only like a few spaces in these dimensions that are really occupied. So basically, 90, most of the protein are in just in a few locations, except if you have glycine. So, that, so really, you can even reduce space, search space much more. Uh, so, but of course, you, but, but you're not, this, of course, in reality, proteins do not move along the hydro the angles, they move in Cartesian space. And of course, there's more change in the stove structure. But anyway, however you do this, you need an ND function also. So this is the standard molecular mechanics ND function. I will not go through it very carefully, but this is good to know basically how do you describe an ND of a system using molecular mechanics. And that's, uh, so that's, so this is basically you have energy, which is the between two. Uh, well, you sum it up for all, all atoms, and the two atoms they have some kind of uh, in, if they are bond, bond to each other. You have a bond length, so basically it's basically a spring constant if it's a fixed minimum, and you have a bond length like that. So basically, if, it's, if, if, if you pull it out, put it together, you get just a square root uh, equation with that. You have a bond bending, so if you have three atoms of that, you can basically, if you have them like that, of course, this is the ideal minimum. If it moves around, it has a, also a square root in uh, the, the halo space. But in torsion, you have the same thing here. You have a torsional angle. You have, you have normally last three torsional angles are most preferred, in between them, they have a higher energy. And you have the constant here, that are different cases, mm-hmm. constant here. So th- these things are the bonded interactions. These are only occur between atoms that are bond to each other, or one, two, or three, or four. So of course, these are not very, very expensive to calculate because they are basically one. Ex- if you make put in one step longer, it's one extra interaction. So it's, 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 it's linear with the size of protein. However, the interaction between proteins that are not bond to each other, the ones that are interacting with a solution, which you can divide into the van der Waals. So basically, uh, and the electrostatic interactions, and sometimes you have a higher bond interaction also. That's the thing most force fields do not have that longer. Maybe, but historically, you had it. You can, because you can limit that by these two terms. So, van der Waals is basically the same thing as every gas. Basically, these two atoms do not want to, uh, to collide. So, if they get so close together, you have a very, very strong repulsive force here with a factor from it. But also, there is a weak interactive force because you have a dipolar moment of the electron spins that bring them together. So this is just classical chemistry. You have two gas molecules interact. 
And then if you have charge molecules, that are, and they charge not only the ones that have full charge, but you have actually partial charge on most atoms. And of course, this is just a classical Coulomb interaction. So, uh, and then this, so these things, of course, you have to ideally calculate every pair of atoms in, 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 in your system, but often, particularly this one dies out because it's very small off sometimes, and even this one, for some distance, you can keep calculating it. So basically, there's this stretching term, it's basically a spring that you move like that. Bending term is just an angle, you can move like that, it's a ideal value, and the torsional angle is an angle to determine like that. And it depends on what, what atom it is, it has two or three minima. In fact, with n, yes, you can have five, three. And if you almost get only one minima, basically, but if it's uh, another angle, you have to have two or three minima. And then you have the non bond interaction, you have the stick to hydrogen bonds, but you have the Coulomb interaction, which is like statics. And every atom has a partial charge on it. So that can be a, a pattern, and then have a pattern interaction there. So this is what you do with my dynamics. So if you do my dynamics, you have to calculate all these, all these interactions, and you have to calculate the forces, and you integrate over some short time step, and you move all the atoms. And you recalculate all the forces, uh, forces and interactions and calculate again. So you can see that there's a lot of calculations. Um, well, so just to summarize, you can basically have you can have simplified models, you have, for instance, side chains or side chains, or you have the uh, or simplified side chains. You can reduce the, the, the degrees of freedom by using in lattice or off lattice, or using in the tahedral space. Um, you can have some kind of uh, 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 type to describe the environment, basically water solution in different ways, so you summarize things like that. And it has, um, since you always have like some kind of balance between uh, complexity and uh, detail. So yeah, yeah, this is a list of what people have done throughout the years. So when they, some people have had very, so this is basically molecular dynamics, particularly if you use, use your electron photons, you can have, but here, here is, these are the most detailed methods. But and what people have is also very, very simplified models, like this is a present paper by Michael Levitt. So, see, Levitt here is actually got Nobel Prize last year. Partly for, well, not well, for some of this work here uh, in the 70s. And, but the people, so people have tried a lot of different things. I see here with this Skolnik model, so it has a nice, fine square matrix, but uh, and using half a residue for each atom. While well, David Baker, who we'll talk about later, uses fragments here, which is a way to reduce space, and uses some kind of extended atoms. So use more than one, more than one, at, uh, one sphere is having more than one atom. And uh, so the, the, the people have tried many different things throughout the years. And. Uh, So basically, as I said, basically what you often come up with that what you want to have is something like, like this funnel here. So you want to have some so, energy minimum here. This is the native structure. And uh, the idea is what you see with this left, simplified left ones when you make ideal like things is, is that you can behave like that. This so you have a big so confirmation space here that is has very high energies, and then the, you can take many different paths, and you always end up here in this free and the, the minima. And this I think I already talked about. Uh, so after the break, I will talk about probably the, the first method that had like, some general applicability, and it's method called by David Baker, called Rosetta. So this was probably, when the, the, throughout the history, there's been probably hundreds of papers published. We have solved for the folding problem, and we have we have done that in different ways. And no, but nothing that really worked. I mean, there have been no paper. It often worked in uh, 
in unique cases, and uh, you showed it in the papers in the work. But then when, when we saw when people saw this CASP competition, when they did blind prediction, in the beginning nothing worked at all. It was very very rare that you could be lucky in one case. And the only method that after a few CASP competitions actually showed to at least more than randomly, more than once in a while, fold proteins was Rosetta. There was a few other methods that were very similar in idea, developed by other people at the same time, so it was not the only method, but it was the one that took off most. So that is, uh, so David Baker made his Rosetta program together with co-workers. And this is, this is actually some examples of how he folded it. So this is from CASP 5, so in 2004 or something like that. And so you see, you can look at that. The name structure and the model. That's fine. In most cases, they, they're not perfect, but they kind of look similar, some way similar at least. And I will tell you, talk a bit about that after the break. So let's meet Tempest. So. So the, the aim of the second half of this lecture is to talk, tell you about two methods. First, Rosetta, and then something uh, quite recent, what they call EV fold, something like that. So as I said, Rosetta was probably the first or uh, method that actually blindly proved that structure, abelian structure prediction could work. And the whole idea of Rosetta is basically based on something you can summarize here. It's that what, 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 can we, I mean, when we search confirmation of space, we have basically two problems. We have a global trend that hydrophobic estrogen should be in, in, in the middle of the protein. And we have also local preference, that some, so we know that from, uh, well, from, from the folding. We also have a local trend that we know that from sec that there are <coughs> a lot of sh helices and sheets that are formed, that there are a lot of local information that should form things into helix sheets. But we also know that it's not um, just so that um, uh, the same amino acid sequence always is in helix, always in the sheets. So we, people, have, people have tried before to take like, helix and sheets back together. So some some helices some amino acids are very preferred in helices. Some are not. Some can be a bit mixed. So it just depends. So th these early methods that just tried to protect, protect fixed secondary structure pattern had never really worked. But we also know that there are not. It's not only here in the sheets. There are also so-called super secondary structure problems and so on. So if you could divide a problem into two different problems, you have a local preference that is basically here in the sheets to a large extent, but also also loops and uh, maybe even super secondary structures that could be predicted from local information and they have a global structure that is basically dominated by visibility. If you can divide these two, two problems together, you can maybe make the problem easier. And that was developed, the idea was to use fragments. Basically, instead of taking, making proteins that are, by making the structure prediction by, by taking one amino at a time, you take a whole fragment and you replace another fragment with another fragment. And there's another, another couple of groups that did the same thing or similar things at the same time, but <coughs> the dominating method of the out was, was the Rosetta. I think there's a movie for this also, if it works. So this, is, this is a Rosetta talk, so the the nation talk. The problem we are focusing on at Rosetta at home is the prediction of protein structures from their amino acid sequences. Almost all human diseases are caused by mutations in proteins that affect uh, their three-dimensional structures and functions. And so if we could reliably predict protein structures, we could understand how mutations cause disease and uh, from there uh, perhaps go on to develop therapies. I'm working on this is the way to trying to this design... Like most of the diseases are caused by mutations. Broken legs are very rare caused by mutations, but yeah, he doesn't care about that immunogens that will elicit antibodies against HIV, so uh, a critical part, part of a, a vaccine, design proteins that will present that piece of HIV at just the right confirmation, so that if that protein, once it's taken off a computer and turned into a real physical protein, if it's put into a person's blood, it will cause that person to make antibodies uh, 
against the, the epitope of HIV. Up until recently, it's been pretty much thought impossible to reliably predict the structure of proteins from their sequences. Instead, protein structures are currently determined using time-consuming and expensive experiments, which can only be applied to a small subset of proteins. If instead we could accurately and reliably predict protein structures, it would revolutionize much of molecular biology. To carry out this work, we've developed a computer program called Rosetta. Success in our work would have broad-ranging implications for human health, ranging from the development of a vaccine for HIV to the eradication of malaria. The sequence of amino acids that make up proteins is directly determined from the genetic code, otherwise known as the sequence of molecules in DNA. DNA, like proteins, is also made of molecular subunits with specific properties. Within the nucleus, a kind of imprint of DNA is transcribed into a similar molecule called RNA. Okay, this is very basic. Carrier molecules transport amino acids to an enormous structure called a ribosome. The ribosome translates the information in RNA into a chain of amino acids. You know, think about putting a rope in a box with no gravity, and think about how many different ways this rope could actually fall in that box. Um, so, you know, the number of combinations and the number of possibilities are pretty much astronomical. A strand of amino acids, the order of which has been determined by the genetic code, can indeed be thought of as rope or chain-like. However, the properties of the links, in this case amino acids, cause portions of the chain to be attracted to or repelled from each other, as well as elements in the cellular environment. What the Rosetta program does is calculate the likelihood of these interactions between segments of the chain based upon favorable energy levels. The most likely 3D structure of the chain will take the least amount of free energy to fold. Last summer I started modifying Rosetta to be used with the Boink distributed computing platform. Before Boink we had around 400 computers that we could run our calculations on locally. But now with Boink we have thousands of computers um, that we could run our jobs on located all around the globe. And it's really exciting to see how it does. So, okay, so they, they also use these parallelized computing. So they also have thousands of or millions of computers around the world you can take it on. So, but uh, but that, that was the latest development, it was just the PR stuff for us. So the idea here, as I said, is basically you have the, the local confirmation somehow precedes the collapse. And that's probably true to some extent. The experimental studies show that. It doesn't mean that it's formed exactly, but there's some tendency to form a local structure already in an unfolded protein. Basically, if, you, if you, there are amino acid sequences, that uh, information in amino acids that prefer to be in helix or sheet or loops. So there are some, these tendencies are there. And then the basic is a collapse from unfolded to folded, and the problem has to uh, unfold the fold several times. So basically, if you can take a look at the first, you can you could gain some limited space of folding search somehow. So the idea is basically that you have a protein that you can take uh, small fragments. You take start with the folded, unfolded protein like that, and you replace some part of it, maybe this part here, to form a helix, and you take another part from here. And take another part here, and you part another part here, and then unchange a bit in here, and a bit in the fold, and then finally get the fold. So this, I guess, looks like the Dylan head piece again, a famous folding protein. So, and in each step you do that, you basically, uh, it doesn't have to be here, and here it's going to be replaced by a sheet, but the whole thing is a region that is preferred to be here, you always replace by here. So, for, what you do there before that is that you search. Basically, yeah, sequence search for the most likely fragments for each part of the se sequence. And then you have, uh, so you have basically do something like this. You, have, so you select the fragments. So for each amino acid fra fragment, that are normally three to nine residues long, you have a list of possible fragments. You see, this is just some part of the photo, and you see the blue one here. These are fragments that shoots from, they're not identical, but they have a tendency to be extended, so back to the beta sheet, not all that completely. But while in the green one here, this has a very, very strong tendency to be helix. Not all the helix are exactly identical, but they are basically, you have a helix here, and this has a tendency to be second loop region. 
So there's a tennis in the fragments. They're not always perfect, but among these, in January 20 or 30 days, among these 20 or 30, most likely there's something is correct there. And most, in, for, for at least this large part of tokens. So then you basically take your protein and you replace one part of it with a new fragment. So you take here, you take a replacement here of this, I guess, this fragment. This green region here, and you get another protein. And then you do what is called Monte Carlo simulations, which are uh, well, use the many these simulations, and basically you take uh, uh, see if the energy, so you have if, and some energy, if that is lower or if it's not too high, you accept the move. If it's if it's too bad, it's threw it away. And ideally, then you generate a lot of different fu fu functions here. And ideally, if your energy function is good, is that the native structure should have the lowest free energy. So you should search here between them. And these are bad, and this is a bad trap to get stuck in because this is a low MD but the wrong structure, but this is the native structure, so it should be done. Is there an overlap um, between the fragments or is it only the They same? can overlap, so, so, so yeah, so they, they, can, so they can overlap, yes. They're, they're, you can play around with it, but they're, 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 you, you, you can't say, that, otherwise you say that these are best fragments. So, of course, you, so there are, uh, one part of fragment will certainly not, I mean, you can, can be replaced with other parts, so it's just a random replacement. Of them. So well, most of the replacements, I would guess, are completely failures because you completely destroy things. But at least when it gets compact, but that's that's why you need to try it many times. Well, this is just this. this yeah. uh, uh. So. Uh, you are uh, 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 yeah, so the fragment library is basically you have a known structure. You, you take this fragment library, you take the known structures, and you, have, you take it for the sequence and then you search it. Basically, I mean, it's simple. You just do a blast search basically against the fragment libraries, and you take some low cutoffs. You don't, don't, don't take strong hits, you just take the shoot. But the tendency you will have things that look similar. And then you do the prediction. Let's have a picture again, if I have a climber. Uh, and um, they have uh, so the no, well the, the idea is of course you should have no I mean you should don't do it you do it if you have no homology, you should take away everything that's too identical and you do some clustering and stuff and so on. And uh, uh well, so, you, so you, you don't think fragments are identical in every case, and, and you generate maybe a few hundred, or anything from 25 to a few hundred different fragments, and, this, and you can have some, uh, some rankings so that the most similar sequences are more likely to be chosen. But th th these are details, but the idea, the idea is the real, this, the, the, these fragments are the way to replace things. And then you have an energy function. So basically, you, you can think about it. You take the unfolded protein, you replace it with this. And as long as you have an energy function, you can probably do some, something quite good at uh, 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 so you need you need to have an energy function that has a clear minimum of the energy structure. So you really want to have an energy function, as in every case, have a minimum of the energy function. So you need to describe all the physics of the free entity of the structure as good as possible. And it also it should have some kind of clear path. It shouldn't, shouldn't be too sensible to small changes, because then it would never go to stack local minimums. And then you should, should be able to find it there. So basically what you have in the any function is high publicity, is a key thing. You don't have to care so much about the side chains, the, the local interaction, because they are already taken from fragments, they are already correct. You don't have to bother about, about like hydrogen bonds between in the helix and so on, because they are already there, because you, you know that if it is something that should be in the helix, the fragment is going to already have the helix. You don't have to care so much about it. They have some information about that, that also, but it's not that strong. You have some, uh, of course, things that shouldn't overlap, shouldn't collide. You have some things that drive it to be compact, so it doesn't, it doesn't want to be extended change. And then you have of course, some information about pairwise contacts between sidechains, particular polar sidechains. 
it's always much more difficult to get beta sheets to work because basically in helix you can think you have a helix one helix and two helix back together but in the beta sheets you really have to get interactions of two sheets together together and, uh, of course there are no interaction here and then you have to go this is all the interaction when they got together so, th so there has a special way to deal with that beta sheet hydrogen bonding potential so then try to get an extra strong once you see it you want to, don't want to lose it Okay, you want to find three and nine and three fragments from those structures. You want to score, as it's basically as I said, as I already said. And you take the randomly chosen nine and three fragments from the top 25 in the rank list and, and replace it. So basically, you take the, exactly, you take your proton model, you take why it is nine residues, you put it in there, you're going to have a completely different structure, and you calculate the, uh, calculate the energy. Uh, and, you, and you do it many times. So. So in this case, this is all data, you try 28,000 insertions and 8,000 simulations. Oh, I know, then you did three, just you did 36,000 replacements. So you normally run a few hundred times a time, but you also need to maybe run the whole simulation well, at least a few hundred times to get it to work well. Um, I'll use what is, is called Bayesian treatment and distribution, known proven structures, that's basically the statistical potential. So this is the key thing here in many of these things, like you don't calculate the physics of, this, of this is basically the same type of potential as we had in uh, uh, in the threading function I talked about yeah, you know, last week. So basically, the probability to find residue A and B in contact, and you calculate it from, from the known structures. And you do the same thing for other, uh, other terms, like solvation, and the base is just a way to, base is just a way to weight it together. You start here with a few, few thousand, few hundred thousand simulations in the population decoys, and you maybe use filtering, and uh, um, well, this is some details, it's not so important. Uh, a key thing actually they notice here is actually that you use clustering. So, uh, also you generate these thousands and thousands of models. And the energy function is not always uh, that accurate. So, like, of course, some some are going to be a little high, and then you can throw them away. But if you find one set of models many times, they're very similar to each other, or quite similar to each other, that all have actually some of them have low energies. That is, uh, so that's, that will be clusters. You can use cluster things that are similar to each other together, and they can hold different family members. So, if you do that, that that is quite likely to be correct cluster, because basically there are many more ways. To, to have something completely wrong, you have to have something right. If you see the same answer many times, you're quite likely to be correct. So often you say that the largest cluster assumed to contain the best structures, or, or if you take a few clusters here. So you have some field things, some specific rules for sheets, etc. So particular sheets are hard to find. So if you find some beta sheets, higher models, you, you take that into account. Uh, and then you can calculate after then you find this cluster, you can make a more carefully, more accurate uh, prediction by adding the side chains that have more detailed models. So basically, often you end up with something like this. So this is the a good simulation. This is the some kind of energy that they have. Uh, so they have uh, minus 10 to so whatever any term they have here. This is the protein. And this is how far away you are from the structure. So you said that in these simulations in deep time, you end up with one onstrom, but the best thing to generate is two onstroms. So you see, of course, on average, there is some kind of correlation with uh, the distance from the native structure here. So the, and actually, if you really like this, thing you really like it, actually the best or one of the best models have the lowest energy. But the, the energy difference between that one and that one and that one is not very big, and these are much worse models. It's clearly not as good as this one. So the energy function is not perfect at all, but there are a number of models here, and probably cluster here, the biggest cluster, I mean, you would probably pick that one. So this is just some models that look like so this is. So this is the native structure. This is the best model. See, so it looks quite similar. I mean, this sheet is not as perfect, and this here this is probably too short, and this uh, slightly different angle, etc. But most of it looks great. 
This is more than that could be drawn in out here. So during the years, Rosetta has developed uh, this, is, this is kind of standard. And they, so it sort of works and works for smaller proteins, particularly for epigenetic ones. And particularly if you run it many times, you get the same answer. Then you can trust it quite a lot. So if you really have a big cluster that is that's dominant, then most likely it's correct. But it's of course never ever really atomistic, but the perfect model is always a bit, a bit off. So this is just some data of things they have in the database when they have, uh, so in most cases this is the analysis they have for some models. In this case it didn't do that well. There are 28 models that are high, have lower energies, while in most other cases this one is not that good either, it's number 9, but in most cases it's first ranked out of 1000 or 20 models. Well, that's the same again, sorry. Uh, the paper I gave you is uh, about uh, an extension of the so they have a second step of in Rosetta, and also generate these tens of thousand models. They have a more accurate energy function. So, accurate, so basically, what they do is that they build all the side chains, and not only build the side chains, they actually build the side chains and they change the structure a little bit, they rebuild all the, uh, and they also change back a little bit, and they calculate a new energy. And you do, do this many, many, many times. So basically, you have small data changes, you build side chains, you minimize, and you have that energy, and you repeat it a few times for, for every member of the big clusters. And then so you can actually see, so you can move the model a little bit here from the red to the blue, or the other way around. So you can move it slightly. And the, the, it's not that the movement makes it so much more, 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 much better, but the energy function is way much better. You're much better at evaluating the good from the bad model. So in this case, they actually had another model with less than 1.5 volts of RSD and 5 to 6 small proteins in the blind test. Uh, so they have, the other thing they made lately, it's kind of fun game, they have a game called Fold It. This is where you can play the computer simulation game. We actually can do these things in house. By now you may have heard of the game called Fold It and how its players helped solve the crystal structure of a protein that had remained unsolved for years. The findings were recently described in a prestigious journal and in the pop popular press. Today I'll explain what Fold It is and show you how to get started using it. So this is a computer game. Fold It is a scientific project aimed at solving uh, the protein folding problem. The idea is somehow to get Predicting the way the proteins fold is a very important problem key to many areas of biology and medicine. Predicting how proteins fold is also computationally kind of very difficult yourself, due to the large numbers cases. of possible solutions that need to be tried. Fold It's unique insight is that humans... I do this by clicking... Oh, sorry. By first, and then yeah, click yeah, create. Okay, okay, okay. Ah, sorry. I don't have to watch the whole thing. By clicking on the background, you click here, you can, you can, get, you can look at the interactions. After looking at the scene from a few angles, it's clear that I need to move one move, side chain away from the other. Way the I do this by clicking on it and dragging. It's really a computer game. And, and I actually used it for a number of different problems. The next and challenge to find some involves clearing the clash from from caused by two side uh, chains. No social life that, that spent the time playing this. Some of it is a really good. One of the uh, powerful things, things about Fold It is its suite of automated tools. This level introduces the shake tool, it's not a, which a, will a, rotate a, side a, chains a, around a stationary. Uh, looks like that worked. The training levels go on to increase in complexity. Here's a more the good advanced thing is training that it actually gives you, gives you some insights into protein physics somehow. You can play around with it and see what, what is the origin of physical thoughts that makes protein look bad or what look bad. I'm not sure how useful these three to four large protein foldings for answer for the folding. So, oh, sorry, oh, this was um, flying. Yes. So, okay, so the last part I'm going to talk about is what happened recently, so like starting 2009, 10, and that's a completely different solution to the protein folding problem. And that's 
Actually, it seems very promising, and it has been a number of impressive papers about it already. And the idea is basically that you can describe a protein with a contact map. So this 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 protein, this is protein structure, and this is a contact map. So this is a residue number versus residue number. You have a dot whenever two residues interact. So this is kind of uh, obvious. You can really take this one, this one, etc. And uh, you can uh, uh, do that by uh, uh, so so basically what you say if you have this content map, it's actually not that hard to make the structure. It's I mean, if you have a perfect content map, it's kind of almost trivial, but it might not not. And basically, this is what you have for NMR. So basically, in, in all structures you have contact, but you have between atoms, but more or less the same thing. And uh, so the question is, can we predict the contact map? Can we, can we identify the residues that interact with each other? So this, this is something people worked on for quite a long time, but uh, until a few years ago, it didn't really work. Okay, so this is just this is right here. However, and the idea how you work on this is basically, if you have a contact in a protein, so for then of course these residues are interacting here, but then you have a mutation, so this pentamer uh, uh, change to an arrow, then this is of course not really favorable, so that this, the protein gets less stable, but then you can have a compensating mutation that changes this square to a better mass, so it fits better. So basically, you can have correlation between positions in the protein sequence. So, this had people realize, if, if you, have, so you, can, you can measure correlations in different ways, when you have mutual information, that's how you measure correlation, you have a correlation coefficient, or in terms of dimensions, but uh, so people, th th these people realize that this is useful if you have multiple sequence alignments. If you have multiple sequence alignments and look at correlations, then uh, so we can see if you have uh, if you have a correlation here, but if you think about if you have one position that is big in one part and uh, to they behave the same way, but oh, opposite ways. So there are one type of I mean acid up here and another type down here, and then the other one has the opposite. We would assume that these two proteins, that these two residues, are interacting. The problem here, so these people realized already in the 90s, so people are doing this, and uh, it has some information, but it's not very good. And the reason is why it's not very good is because you can't, there are indirect and indirect interactions. So you have, if A interacts with B, and B interacts with C, you will see a correlation between A and C also. And that we maybe even see, and if D and E are correlated in the same way, you can have uh, indirect, uh, because uh, you can have indirect interaction, this is going to wrong. And actually, th this interaction with A and C can become stronger than the one, uh, the correlation can become stronger than the one with A and B, than the two interactions, because there are statistical reasons. So this is actually a problem that was known in uh, icing models, so in spin glasses, for decades. And actually, the theoretical solution to it was already partly published already in the nine, late 90s, but nobody really noticed it and nobody really it didn't really work. Because to make it, so there are ways to decouple the direct and indirect interactions. There are several methods to do that. I mean, this is one of the papers, and it's another one I print, print a few. And the way that is, is um, uh, the reason why it works now is because we have much bigger multiple sequence alignment. We can easily, for many proteins, have thousands of sequences aligned. So we can really get big multiple sequence alignments. He has demonstrated how differences, the different the things are. So if you if you have a protein and you make pretty the contour map and you use the old methods, the ones that use directly the correlation or in this case called mutual information. You get a map, map like this. You see here you have, I think it's actually highlighted, but some of the predictions are, well, these are probably the correct ones, but only you see here. So you only see the correct predictions here. And you see here, the blue ones are correct and the red ones are wrong. So most of them, 22% I mean, are correct and 78% are wrong. There are some correct predictions here and there. But really, 
for this kind of map, you know, most of the things are in here at the ends and the middle, so you, you, can't really, you can never really make a prediction of the model. Uh, I need to plug in my... Uh, so, uh, however, if you use what's called a mean field DSA method, one of the first methods, you do slightly better. You see, they have a nice, even slightly better in this case, but you have a few more long. This, yeah, this one, this, this is a sheet sheet contact probably. Because you see the sheet, remember, anti parallel sheets, going to have it going to look like that. You can see the contact map here. And this one, you actually, you see, have, you have quite a lot of correlation here. Uh, again, I don't know which one it is, but it's probably the one over here somewhere. Uh, but it most still is not that good. However, the, the methods improved, so the method called Psykov, that is developed much better. So this is clear here, you actually have something useful. Half the contacts are correct. So half the contacts we predict are correct. It might still have, but it's, you can still see this. Oh, no, it's here, here's the interaction here, and this is here, here, here. This one's down here, also that, but we're missing this part here. This is some part here. We're not we're missing a lot of false, strange, positive things here. We're missing interaction at the beginning. You know. But clearly, from this contact map, it would not be impossible for them to fold the structure. And there's even a further improvement by, by group at KTH, which somehow cleaned it up uh, even more. So this is quite nice. Well, you still have some errors here, but these are local contacts, a bit of a heel sheet, so that's uh, caused by probably gaps, maybe. So this is actually quite nice. Because still, still, a lot of contacts missing, but still, even this one we have one here, of some of them right, right here, etc. And, and we have worked on improving this further, but I won't show you the results of that. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit how an example how well things are working here. Yeah, so th this is uh, mm. so th this is a protein, and I guess that the grey one is the native structure, and the colour one is the one we predicted, or the other way around. I can't really tell because they're basically identical. The RNC is too long, so it's not a perfect one. You see, this loop is stiff. The loop is here is not perfect. This one is a bit shifted on, but it's still quite good, I would say. Have another match of 81% of the contacts are correct, or 81% more than another way correct. And this is why well, you can't even see it. You can't even see contact maps here. They are well, the, the colors are bad. But you should be able to see how the most 80%, 86% of the contacts are pretty correctly with our, our method P can see. Mm. Yeah, this is just another example of a protein we folded. That's an RNC of 1.75 angstrom, and it's uh, pretty much correct. This loop here is not very good. Some of the loops are not perfect. So, and this is, in this case, what we do is basically we just take this context and we add it to the Rosetta in this case. Now, there are several different ways to do it. Rosetta is a good way, but it's not the fastest way to do it. So, as to summarize this uh, part of the basically Rosetta's idea is to have an energy function. And you put fragments together, and the fragments really preserve the good local quality of the lo uh, of the secondary structure, etc. And that somehow has worked quite well for small proteins, particular alpha helical proteins, but it, it doesn't scale up to very big proteins. On the other hand, this idea of getting contact predictions, so you really get context first and use this for full structure, has proven to be very useful for these protein families that have many, many, many sequences. Unfortunately, we say for most of these protein families that have many, many sequences, we already know the structure, so that's not so useful. The exception is member proteins. So there are a number of member proteins where you really can uh, do this quite uh, accurately, yeah, and where the structure is not known. So that's, that's the last slide. So any questions?